This month, of course, we are celebrating Christmas and who is excited about Christmas? Come on. Anyone? Oh yeah. Have you made your list? Have you checked it twice? Hopefully you've been good and not naughty. Um, this today, I wanna talk about something that I really feel that God has been laying on my heart quite significantly. And I feel the urgency of it and the tension of it and the intensity of it. And I want to talk about reacting to a change in your life, reacting to a change in your life. We all know that God often makes changes in our lives, whether we are ready for it or not ready for it. Now, if I asked you all, who's ready for a change? Some of you would cheer, yay! And others of you would go, no, not really. I'm quite good just to be where I'm at. Some of you might even go, well, what's the change? You might want to investigate it first and find out what, what is the change that's going on before I commit to this. I don't wanna just go, yay, we all have different personalities in this room right now. But either way, change demands a reaction from every one of us. Whenever a change is afoot or a change is actually happening, there's always a reaction that happens in our lives. And so I want to read the Christmas story that is very famous in, in uh, the Gospel of Matthew. And we're going to be reading from chapter two. Some of it's in chapter one. We're going to read it mostly from chapter two. Because when Jesus came, there was a massive change and then there was so many different responses and reactions from people. So here we are, Matthew chapter two, verses one to 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi, many of your scriptures would say the wise men, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and we have come to worship him. When King Herod, who was the king of Israel at that time, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, Report back to me so that I too may go and worship him. We knew he really wasn't trying to. After they had heard the king, they went on their way and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was born. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We won't talk about those three things, but interestingly, those three things are very significant that when you give the gift of gold, it's usually honoring someone as a king. When you give the gift of frankincense, you're honoring them in a priestly role, but when you give them a gift of myrrh, you're actually celebrating their death. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. They returned to the country by another route. What was the change that was going on here? What was the spiritual seismic shift that was happening here? Well, it tells us in verse one, it says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea, Jesus was born, this human, this baby that we call God. He wasn't just a human, of course, we believe that he was God because in Matthew chapter one, verse 23, it says the virgin, the angel, speaking to, the angel speaking to Mary said, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel. Now we don't usually use that word. It's, not, it's a very Jewish word. It's a very odd word, but it basically means God is now with us. This wasn't just that a baby came to earth, but that God would suddenly find himself manifest amongst his people. This hadn't happened in this way before. And so the scriptures are naming the shift that happened. And today, I want to look at what happens when God moves in your life. When God moves in your life. The first thing I want to talk about is that when God moves in your life, there is a shift that is felt 
in your entire life, in your body, in your mind, in your spirit, in the things that you do and the things that you touch. Even the people around you will feel the shift when God is moving either in your life or through your life. And they will start to react to you. When a big presence comes into the room, you feel it. You see some of these groupies that when their, their rock star or their pop star or their movie star comes into the room, they start freaking out and they're, ah, and they start screaming. Or maybe it was when, you know, when you were a child and your father would come home and suddenly you would start not mouthing off to your mother, right? Maybe that when you feel that presence come into the room, you have a different response because something has shifted in the room that you're standing in. Or maybe you were a teenager at one point, right? And you had a crush on a girl and then she came into the room, into the room and suddenly your, your stomach went all funny, right? Anyone ever had that before? Just me? Okay. Just look at your wife and nod. That was true. It's true, that's how I felt. But when something happens, when there's a presence, when there's a change, there's a, something shifts within yourself. And Jesus wasn't, it wasn't just a matter that there was a human being that suddenly came in a room, but that that human being was directed by God to do something different, that his manifest presence was shifting things. And this even happened several times in Jesus' life. Let me show you a few other examples of when this happened. There was a time when Jesus was being baptized and it says as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him and even the voice of heaven, a voice of God came from heaven and said, this is my son whom I love and in him I am well pleased. Something happened when God moved everything started to respond to it. Heaven was reacting to it. And then even later on, he started his ministry and he went to a local synagogue and he decided to, to get up and he said, hey, do you mind if I start saying something? Can I, can I read a scripture? And they're like, get on up there, Jesus. And so he opened up the book of Isaiah, which talks about that the spirit of the Lord is upon me to proclaim good news to the poor, freedom to prisoners, recovery of sight to blind, to set, oppressed the, free, uh, to set the oppressed free and for the year of the favor of the Lord. And he began by saying to them, today, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Up to this point, it was just a scripture. Up to this point, many other people had read that scripture and they had talked about it. But when Jesus decided, I'm gonna move and something is about to shift, something's about to move, they all felt it. How do I know that? Because they said this, all spoke well of them and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. This wasn't a group of people who were like, who's this guy? Boy, he's a really good speaker. No, isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? They knew who he was, but they could feel that something had shifted, something had changed within this guy that they had known for 30 years, but they had never seen God shift in his life. They had never seen God move significantly in him and through him. The last time was when he was actually on the cross and there was a multiple of things that, that started to be felt in nature and in the community around him that when he died on the cross, it says in Matthew 27, 45, that darkness came over the land between the, the time of noon and 3 p.m. that afternoon. Just darkness came over. The whole place went dark. In Matthew 27, 51, it says the temple curtain was torn. In Matthew 27, 51, it says that there was an earthquake. In Matthew 27, 52, it says that hundreds were raised raised from the dead. Hallelujah. Do you see what happens that when God decides to do something, it's felt in everything and in everyone around him. Which then takes me to the next thing that I wanna talk about. And it's this, that when the shift happens, it demands a reaction. You can't be neutral to when God decides to move and to do something significant. It doesn't mean that God doesn't care and he's lazy and he's got nothing else to do. No, he's waiting for the right time when things will start to shift. He's waiting for the right time when it is in his plan to do something in your life and through your life. Maybe it hasn't happened yet. Maybe it is a foot. Maybe you're feeling it right now. But whatever is happening, you know this, that you're feeling a reaction within yourself. You're probably even seeing reactions in other people around you as well. And I want to show you in this Christmas story 
What was happening that was when Jesus came, what type of reactions were manifesting when Jesus arrived on earth? And the first one is this, nature reacted. Nature reacted. In Matthew 2 verse 9, it says, after the Magi had heard the king, they went on their way and the star that they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until, uh, sorry, the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. I don't know about you, but how many stars do you know of that seem to start moving and then stop? And then they start moving and then they stop. That's an unusual star. And the Magi, which, which is the wise men from the East, they probably came from Syria. They were, well, that's actually where we get our word magician from. They were probably scientists, right? So they were, they were used to reading science and looking at, at evidence and looking at all the different, ish, the different ways that this could be happening. How is it possible that this star is starting and then it's stopping? We should go follow that star and see what it's doing. There were scientists who were actually following the evidence of what was going on. Now, there are three possible scenarios of why the star was moving and then stopping and moving and stopping. Now, some people would say, ah, this is astrology. This is when the stars affect life on Earth. Well, to some degree, stars do affect life on Earth, right? We know that the, the moon, the, the lunar cycles have an effect on the oceans. We know that, they know that sunspots even have effect on our earthly weather. But I don't believe that this was astrology. I just don't believe that stars have spiritual power. They might have physical power to affect our earth, but I don't, have, I don't believe that they have spiritual power. Another explanation for this weird star and its behavior is maybe that life on earth affects the stars. Well, scientists even tell us, I mean, I think it was Einstein that told us about the, 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 the theory of relativity that our movement affects other things, right? And technically, your movement of me clapping can actually affect a star on the other side of the universe. How does it happen? I don't really know. I'm not really a scientist, but life on earth can can affect the stars. I just don't believe that this situation was what was happening. The third scenario is this, that God affects life on earth and in heaven and they respond and react to each other. That's what I believe. And I believe that I can assume that the Magi were probably scientists that were following this and they decided there must be a meaning to this. You see, when God moves in your life or through your life, when you see God moving, it goes from the natural to the supernatural. The natural starts to act in such a way that is beyond natural laws of order. And it becomes what we would say are supernatural. And so even when you see God moving in your life, you should expect supernatural things to happen around you. When I say expect, I mean you shouldn't be shocked. I mean you shouldn't be like, I don't know what's going on with that star. Let me bury my head in the ground and hopefully that all blows over and it all goes back to normal. No, we need to ask the questions. Why are those things happening? What is going on? Why is it going in that way? Well, let me get to the second group of people. We, we saw that the nature was reacted, but the second group of people was what I'm calling truth seekers. Truth seekers reacted. Now, I'm gonna call them truth seekers and I'll tell you why just in a second. The Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? They came to Jerusalem. They didn't just stay where they were, but they got up and they moved to go to find out what is going on with the star. Now, I believe that they followed the evidence that they had. I have no reason to believe that they were believers in the God of the Old Testament. I have no reason to believe that they even knew who the God of the Old Testament was. But they followed the light that had been given to them. That's why we can trust uh, when people say, well, how is it that, how, how can God send people to hell if they've never heard about Jesus? Listen, God will give light to every person. And as, as they respond and react to the light that he has given to them, he will judge them accordingly. And the beauty of this is that God honored these truth seekers. It's not about that whether they knew Jesus well enough or they knew God well enough. It's that they were willing to go seek out the truth. And even though it led them to the wrong place, what was the wrong place? The wrong place was to go to a palace where Herod was there. They're like, hey, we're looking for the Messiah. Are you the Messiah? 
They didn't end up in the right place. I get it, but that's the whole, that's the whole journey that God is willing to allow us to go on. That as we are seeking truth, we might not end up in the right place, but God will direct us every step once we get to that area. And he goes, no, no, it's not here. Now go to Bethlehem. Does that make sense? We know that if we follow the light, we follow the truth, even if we don't know everything, we're taking the next step. What I love about these guys was they put their money where their mouth was. They didn't say, oh, I'm a truth seeker. I really believe in truth and I really like truth. But they're not willing to actually put any effort in to go find the truth. Now, if you don't believe in, in, in Yahweh, if you don't believe in God of the Old Testament, that's fine. But what effort are you putting into to find out what the truth is to why we are here and what are we made for? Because we all know that we're made on purpose for a purpose. We all feel it. Even those that don't believe in a God, they can feel there's something more significant to life than us just walking around eating and sleeping and pooping and then dying. Right? There's more than that. I love that they put their money where their mouth was. And I want to ask you, what effort are you putting forth to find out what the truth is? What type of effort are you putting forth? Are you putting your money into it? Are you putting your education into it? Are you spending time with wise people? Are you actually opening up your world? Are you making room for truth to come to you? Are you making room for you to find truth? Or are you staying at home hoping that it will come to you while you're watching Netflix? You have to put the effort in. The next group of people out of four, this is the third group of people, is Herod and Jerusalem. They reacted. In Matthew chapter two, verse three, it says, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed. Being disturbed is when the, your normal pattern of, of functioning and operating is disrupted. It's when you feel troubled. It's when you don't have a mental calm. It's when your world is upside down. He was disturbed. Now, I totally get that Herod was disturbed. Why? Because he didn't want to, be, to have anyone else being God. He didn't want anyone else to be in king. He was such a brutal king. He was actually a very clever king. He was in his 70s when Jesus was born. He actually died probably about four years after Jesus was born. But when Jesus was born, he felt a competition coming to him. And his behavior was to take out all competition that stood in his way. He killed his in-laws. Who hasn't ever thought of doing that? He killed, kidding. He killed his in-laws. <laughs> then he killed his wife. I would never do that. <laughs> then he actually killed his sons. <laughs> We're laughing at killing people, right? And on the day he died, he made an edict that all noblemen should be killed when he, was, when he died as well. And the reason he gave is because he wanted mourning to be in the land when he passed away. Talk about a neurotic king. I can see why he was disturbed. What I'm confused with was, why was all of Jerusalem disturbed? Why would Jerusalem be disturbed of hearing of the Messiah coming to their town? Surely they would be, they've been longing for a Messiah. Surely they've been longing for a Messiah that would free them from the Romans and free them from the religious overlords that they had, surely they would want the Messiah to come. Why would they be so disturbed? Well, my only theory to be able to know why, he would want, why they would be so disturbed is because I believe that change became a fearful thing for them. You see, when the Romans came into town, they disturbed everything. They were a brutal overlord as well. And I can only imagine that there was quite a PTSD amongst the city and even amongst the whole country that they didn't want another major change. And I wonder how many of us are not ready to respond well to God because you know that when he moves and he changes, you feel like you're gonna go through pain again and everything is gonna be upside down. Remember the time when you went through sickness yeah, you didn't like it and you don't want to ever do that again. Remember the time when you had to go through a major job change, employment change, and you didn't like it and you don't want to do it again. Maybe you went through a major uh, 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 physical location, geog ge geographically switching from one country to another. Been there, done that. 
Maybe you've had to go through a different relationship change. You went through a divorce. Maybe you've gone through so many different changes that a PTSD has set into you that you're not ready to accept any future change in your life. But you see, when God moves, you can't be defined by the things that you're gonna lose. You can't be defined by the stuff that happened in your past. You have to allow God to move and trust him that he will be with you in the midst of it. That's why they called him Emmanuel. God is with us. God is with me. That whatever change he's about to make, whatever is demanded of me, I can trust that he will give me life because I am gaining Christ, the Messiah. The last group of people that really moves me is Mary and Joseph. When the Magi had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Escape to Egypt. Escape is, comes from the Greek word fugo, which basically is where we get our word fugitive. And what he was saying was, he was saying, become a fugitive in a land that you don't want to be. Why would he go back to Egypt? Egypt was a place of enslavement. Egypt was a place of brokenness. It was a place of rejection. Even the Jews would, would have these prayers and these incantations that they would, uh, or uh, chants that they would remember what God had done for them when they had been enslaved years before. Why would God tell them to go back to a place of slavery and to become a fugitive, which means that you have nothing, you have no power, you have no comfort, you've got more danger around you. Why would he tell them to go back there? He could have called them to go to Galilee or to Edom or to Jabba. They were a little bit safer. And I actually think probably a lot, no, they were a lot closer. And I actually think they were probably a lot safer there as well. There could be many answers that we could give to why he called them to Egypt. But I wanna suggest this, that when God moves, he moves to restore all the places in your life. Amen. You see, he doesn't just want your present or your future. He also wants your past. And I say it again, he doesn't just want your present, he doesn't just want your future, he also wants your past. He doesn't want any area in your life to be your Achilles heel. He doesn't want anywhere, any area of your life that will be the very place that the enemy starts to tackle you on. Because when he comes to accuse you of remember those PTSD emotions that you have and those rejection feelings that you have that are still tied to that time back in your past, well, remember those days, yeah, you're probably gonna fall into that again. It's probably gonna happen to you again. But if you've already been there and God has restored you in that area, you can tell the enemy to go take a hike off a short pier. Why? because you've already been restored in that area. You see, that's why the word Emmanuel is so important to Christians, because God went with Joseph and Mary. God was present there with them. You can return to broken places. You can return to broken relationships. You can return to broken families. Why? Because God is now with you. And the most beautiful thing, I think, when I read this, is the next thing that happened. Stay there until, you, until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt where he stayed until the death of Herod. You think about Joseph. He could have said, have I not given enough? Have I not done enough so far? Have I not given and given and given? I keep giving. You've asked my wife. I gave you my wife for an entire year. I gave you her womb. I own, she, she, my first child is not gonna come from this lady. All the dreams and the desires that I had from this, you're asking me now, to uproot myself again and go off to a land which is a land of bad memories for us. Why would you ask this of me? Can you imagine? Joseph had the right to complain about this, but he didn't. He chose to react and receive what God was going to give to him. Years ago, I was buying, we were buying a new house 
and we'd ask God, give us a new house. We believe that you've called us to something greater and we want to have a new house that'll be a better tool to do what you're calling us to do. And so we searched for an entire year. And as we were going out there, we actually finally found this house that was way beyond what we could ever have imagined. And it checked everything on our list of what we desired. And I was out for a, with a very good friend out for lunch and I was telling him about, yeah, we found this amazing house. And he goes, is that everything that you've asked God for? And I said, yes, and probably more. And he said, have you put an offer on it? And I said, no, because we can't afford it. And then he said something to me that really affected me. And he said this, he said, don't tell God you can't receive what you've already asked him to be given to you. Don't tell God that you can't receive what you've asked him to give to you. You see, every one of us has a choice of what type of reaction we're going to give to God. And you have to decide now what type of reaction you're gonna have with God because he's gonna ask more of you and then he's gonna give more to you. And then he's gonna ask more of you and then he's gonna give more to you. This is the way of God. That when he shifts in your life, you're gonna feel it and you have to decide what reaction you're gonna have. And what you're also gonna find is that when God moves in your life, other people are gonna react against you. So don't be shocked that you might have a Herod in your life. Don't be shocked that all of Jerusalem is gonna be upset with what you're doing. Do not be surprised that supernatural things happen around you. Do not be surprised that even truth seekers seem to want to draw closer to you. You will change the group of people that you're around because you're looking to obey God. You're looking for God to do great things in you and through you. I want to ask you today, do you want to see great things in yourself? Do you want to see God do a shift in your life? Are you ready for it? Because you're gonna have to decide if you don't wanna change in your own life, God's gonna change other people's lives and then it'll change your relationship with them. You're gonna have to decide, do you want to react by saying, yes, Lord, or no, God, I don't want this. You get to choose. Let's stand this morning. Father in heaven, we say yes. Father in heaven, we say yes. I will respond and react to you with a yes. Have your way, do your will in me and through me. That whatever is demanded of me, I pray that we would be like Mary and Joseph who needs to say and who knows how to say, let it be unto me as you will. Forgive us for being like Jerusalem that's, that reacts by being disturbed, that reacts by burying our head in the ground, closing the door and going in a dark room and hoping everything just passes over. That the supernatural things happening around us will pass us by and won't affect us. Lord, we embrace the supernatural, even if it brings danger, even if it brings discomfort. I pray that your word would come clearly to each and every one of us, just as you sent the angels to speak and to minister to Mary and Joseph. I pray you would speak and let your words minister to us so that we can hear your voice once again and say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. May God bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you. I love you.